Good morning. It's um, it's really nice to be here. And those were just fabulous opening comments, and I, I sort of couldn't be teed up much better. So as mentioned, my training is as an economist and mathematician. And when I started doing my research, I got really interested in this field of what was called complex systems, which was really starting in the 1990s. And complex systems are things like economies, the brain, ecosystems, things like that. And there's a group of us, um, mathematicians, physicists, economists, theoretical biologists, who are studying complex systems. And one of the things we found in our research was that diversity makes these systems more innovative, more robust, more interesting, as Benoit was mentioning. And there was sort of this disconnect. As he, as he mentioned in his introduction, when I would talk to organizations and businesses, when you mentioned diversity, there was sort of a feel-good social justice angle to this, as opposed to sort of a bottom line performance angle. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about um, research, some of it by own, but most of it done by sort of a group of scholars that really talks about really just sort of the bottom line benefits of diversity. So the outline is I'm going to start out by talking about complexity a little bit. I want to formally mean, define what we mean by complexity, because if you go to a decent restaurant, they'll, decide, they'll define the pasta as complex. So I want to sort of make sure we nail that down. Then what I want to do is I want to talk about two specific tasks that are relevant to the bank. One is prediction, and the other is problem solving. And what we'll do is we'll talk about why diversity actually is as important as ability in those contexts. And then I'll present a little bit of data and then talk about how we maybe practice leveraging diversity, and then we'll hopefully have some time for some questions. So to frame this a little bit and just sort of juxtapose the bottom line notion of diversity with the sort of social justice notion, I want to use a quote by Wendell Berry, which says, we have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it's possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world is good for us. So why do I begin with this quote? I begin with this quote because I think when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we tend to think of this as the right thing to do. And what I'm going to do is argue that it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also the better thing to do. And that's why we have to sort of change our minds. So a wonderful quote with regard to this is by Astro Teller, who runs Google X, which is Google's sort of innovative out there, you know, self-driving car space. And he says, look, people throw on the word diversity like it's a tip at a restaurant. But what you really want, if you're trying to be a cutting edge innovative place, is people who think in different ways. Right? So that's going to be really the, the key that I think about this. And I have a new book coming out in August called The Diversity Bonus. And the reason I put this out there is I have a previous book called The Difference, um, which is a book about sort of how diversity makes things better. And this was a book written when I was a professor at Caltech. And it's a very mathematical book. And I was at the IMF a couple of years ago, and somebody introduced me. And they said, this is a really good airplane book. And I was sort of surprised that he said that. And then he paused, and he said, if you're flying to Singapore. <laughs> because it's really kind of tough sledding, right? Because it wasn't really written as a business book. This book is written more as a book for practitioners, and it'll come out in August. But my take on this, and the way I come at this, is much more like the way a standard economist would do it. And what I do is I, I come at this by sort of writing simple models to try and organize how we think about things. And I think the theory is incredibly important in this particular space because it's not the case that all diversity necessarily makes us better. This is something that has to be managed and understood. We have to think about how do we get the right types of diversity in the room, and how do we manage those things. So if we don't have a theory, if we don't have an understanding of how diversity makes us better, we're going to end up with what um, my sons, I have two teenage sons, they describe as a dog's breakfast, which is basically you just dump a bunch of stuff in the bowl and hope somebody will eat it. So let's talk quickly about complexity. So if we look at global financial networks, they're much more connected than they were in the past. If you look at how we make policy decisions in banks, so this is um, a chart from the World Bank, but what it shows is it shows the different US banks prior to the bailout. And these numbers that you see between things, like this 456 and this 94, and this is Lehman Brothers, not Lehman Sisters here, right? These, the size of the numbers show sort of how correlated stock prices are in the tails. And so a big number here means if something bad is happening to AIG, that means something bad will happen to Merrill Lynch. So when you looked at sort of this network, what you see is it's not just that we can draw lines between these different financial institutions. It's that some of these lines are stronger than others. And when we think about a particular financial you know, entity, we can't just think in terms of its own balance sheet. We have to think in terms of how it affects something else. So when we talk about complexity, what we mean is we mean things that are connected in sort of deep ways. So a couple years ago, I was involved in a project to try and figure out what's causing obesity. And we solved it. There it is. 
is the simple solution. Now, if you drill, like, obviously you can't read this, that's on purpose. If you drill down, what you see there's different colors in here. So for media, social, economic, food, activity, infrastructure, so everything from lack of sidewalks to large Coca-Colas, everything you can think of is sort of in this graph. But the point is, is that no one, we look at the big picture, no one could possibly understand obesity. We now have so much knowledge, so much information, we recognize there's so much complexity in the world that one person can't do anything anymore, right? If you really want to sort of solve obesity, understand it, you need teams of experts in order to do it. So when we say something's complex, what we mean is that it's between ordered and random. It's not simple, it's not completely random. Or another way we put it is to we say that it's deep. It's something that's difficult to explain, engineer, right, or predict, or evolve, right? So the brain is very difficult to explain. It was extremely difficult to evolve, right? And if you tried to engineer a brain, that would be difficult. And so we would therefore say the brain is complex, right? We wouldn't say a coffee table is complex, right? Because it's none of those things. So if you look at economic phenomena, some of them are complex and some of them aren't. So oil production isn't that complex, right? It pretty much grows in a linear fashion with economic growth. Oil prices, because you can have inventories, you can have tankers just cycling outside of ports waiting for the prices to go up or down, right? Those are complex. So what we want to do is we look at the world, we want to say some things are easy, some things are hard, and it's on the things that are hard that we want to use diversity. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take two tasks. The first one's going to be predicting or forecasting. The second one's going to be problem solving. And we'll talk about why diversity is beneficial in each. So I want to start with, then I was mentioning groupthink. I'm going to start with a book written by a friend of mine called The Wisdom of Crowds. How many have seen this book? Anyone? OK, so it came out about a decade ago. And Jim Sirwicki, who writes this book, he begins with this sort of amazing story of the 1906 West of England Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition. There's 787 people who guess the weight of a steer, and the winner gets some prize, like a cake or a pie or something, right? So there's all these guesses about the weight of the steer, and the average guess is 1,197 pounds, okay, 500 kilos. The steer weighs 1,198 pounds, which is amazing, and this is a great way to begin a book, but it's just an anecdote. So what we'd like to do is move from anecdote to a real science of understanding, like what is it that made this crowd smart? You can prove the following theorem. You can show that if people are making numerical predictions, that the crowd's error equals the average error of the people in the crowd. Well, that makes sense. You think the crowd is about as good as the average person in it, but it turns out the crowd is actually better than the average person in it. The crowd error equals the average error minus the diversity. Now, this is a real theorem. This isn't like a management book theorem that like teamwork equals thoroughness plus effort plus ability plus meaning or something. No, this is like real math, okay? So this is, it's like the Pythagorean theorem. This is a mathematical identity. It's always true. Anytime you have a group of people make numerical predictions, this will be true. So this C is the crowd's prediction. This is the truth. This is just the squared difference between the crowd and the truth. This is the average of the people in the group. So the crowd error, you might think, equals the average, but it doesn't. The crowd error is actually less than the average. And the amount by which it's less is these differences in the prediction. So in Galton's case, here's the actual data. You know, Galton's been dead for 100 years, so he happily shared the data, right? People don't always do that. And uh, so the crowd is off by less than a pound. The average error was about 70 pounds, because these are squared errors. So the point was, these people weren't savants who could just guess the weight of a steer. They weren't some sort of like geniuses from the west of England. The reason the crowd got it right is they were diverse. But this is the general thing. If a problem is easy, this is where complexity comes in. If the problem is easy, Average error is going to be small, right? So the crowd can be smart without diversity. But if the problem's hard, average error has to be big. So the way you create a smart crowd is by having the crowd be diverse, OK? So when I talk to, I spend a lot of time talking to the New York Fed. And recently, I've been doing some things with um, some larger companies on Wall Street. And one of the main things I try and get across is when they put together a portfolio of assets, they think about having diversity, right? That's just one of the key things, right? You want a diverse portfolio of assets. But when I have a diverse portfolio of assets, the reason I do it is to minimize risk. The return I get on that portfolio is equal to the average return on those investments, right? So if one investment, like the yellow investment, does really well and the blue investment does badly, I get the average of those two investments. With a group of predictors, I just showed you the theorem, you actually get better than the average, right? That's a, that's a mathematical fact. It's a mathematical fact that a portfolio, you get the average payoff. It's a mathematical fact with a group of predictors, you get better than the average. So as diverse as your portfolio is in terms of stocks, 
your group of predictors should actually be more diverse, right? Because you're getting this sort of bonus, hence the reason for the title of my book, you get a bonus from this diversity, right? So diversity actually makes you better. Okay, so that was people guessing the weight of steers 100 years ago. So you might say, interesting, but maybe not kind of where we're at now in an age of big data and hyper-sophisticated models. So let me jump to the completely other extreme. Let me jump to sort of what was the most sophisticated case of collective prediction, sort of this is the most sophisticated contest ever run. This is in 2006. Netflix Corporation released all of their data on the people who watch their movies. So if you go to Netflix and you watch a show, it'll give you, a, it'll give you sort of a a guess in terms of how much you're gonna like that show. So if I type in Avatar, it'll say five stars. And the reason it says five stars is because I have two teenage sons and this is, they sort of have figured out this is what my family probably likes and it'll say five stars. If, you know, Benoit's a French intellectual, right? So if he types in Avatar, it may say two stars, right? Because it would be beneath him maybe to, to watch Shakespeare's show. If anybody, so far as I know, anyone types in Rush Hour 3, which is a horrible movie, It'll say one star, right? So that's a really easy movie to predict. So here it is, six years of data, half a million users, 18,000 movies, largest data set ever publicly released. And after they released it, the US Supreme Court said, you cannot release data like this. So it may end up being the largest data set ever publicly released. It's no, it's no longer legal to do this. And what they said is if anybody can beat their internal program, so Netflix had this internal algorithm to predict movies. They said, if anybody can beat us by 10%, we'll give you a million dollars. So what happens is, and here's where diversity comes in. So what happens is all these teams, and this is, these are the, sort of the best and brightest computer scientists, machine learning people in the world. They construct these predictive models where movies have attributes and then people have weights across those attributes. So what do I mean? So an attribute might be how much money did it make in the box office, right? How many weeks was it in the theater? Is it an action movie? How many days has it been available on CD? Also anything you can think of. And where diversity comes in is these teams had to sit around and think about what are the attributes of a movie? What are the things that might matter? And then of those things that are matter, which ones can we scrape off the web? Because you've got to be able to, you can't like code these in by hand for 18,000 movies. So you've got to have some way of like using reviews or using available data to scrape all this information on the med web and throw it into your model. So the early leader in this is Belcourt. And this is going to be the star of the show, this guy, Dr. Robert Bell who's the chief data scientist at AT&T Research Park. And their team, their team was called Belcourt, and they had 50 dimensions for each movie. So he had a whole team of people working on this, and this is kind of amazing. So when you go home tonight, try and think of 50 dimensions for a movie, right? So this is pretty impressive. Their best model could be up by 6.8%, which is pretty good. They could, so 10% they, they win the million dollars, six, they're at 6.8%. Now what they did, which is interesting, is they would like have a whole bunch of different models where like these are the different data and they would sort of give different models different pieces of data and then to kind of average them. Now the reason they did this is you want to sort of avoid overfitting and also one of the things sort of state of the art in machine learning isn't to create one super model, but it's to create a whole ensemble of models that you then average up because otherwise you end up overfitting the data and finding patterns that don't really exist. The other thing you do is you use this technique that's called boosting, which is really interesting. So the first thing you do is called bagging, where you just sort of give, give these algorithms different data so that, they have, so that they're diverse, kind of like giving people different life experiences. It's sort of like making computers like people. The second thing they do is they use this technique called boosting, which attempts to create diversity. So here's what happens. Suppose like I've, blue things are good and are positive ratings and red things, these negatives are negative ratings. So you wind up one model that says everything over here is good, everything over here is bad, and another model that says everything over here is good, everything over here is bad. But what you see is like these things with the pluses, right, um, you're sort of getting wrong. And so what you'd like to do then is like put more weight on these things because you're sort of confused. One model is saying they're negative, one model is saying they're positive. And so what you do then is you say, okay, I'd like to get these ones right and these ones right. And so then you basically put more weight on these particular occurrences and you train something to figure that out. So what these boosting algorithms do is they actually train algorithms to be diverse relative to the other algorithms. So what Belcore does then, instead of just having one model, they actually create 107 different models. None of them are as good as the best model, but by combining these models, they can get to 8.4%. What's making them better? What's making them better is the fact that the models are diverse. 
right? They're, they're systematically making diverse models. So the story's fascinating. This is AT&T Research Park, and if you read the media reports on this, they're completely misleading because they're talking about these people trying to win a million dollars. Okay, this is AT&T Research Park. Dr. Bell, his budget is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. This had nothing to do with winning a million dollars. This had everything to do with winning, right? This was a whole bunch of people competing to see who is the best data scientist, you know, who's, who has the best data science team in the world. This wasn't about the million dollars. They were giving the million dollars to charity. Nobody cared about the million dollars. Everybody cared about winning. But they're two years in to this contest, and they can't get to 10%. And so Dr. Bell's boss calls him in and says, you know what? It's been great that you've been doing this, and you've got a lot of publicity from you winning the contest, but it's over. You've got to stop doing this, because you've got to go. You have this other thing that we like to call a job, and we would like you to go back to your job. So he says, fine, fine, I'll just win this thing. You know, cue the Chariots of Fire soundtrack. I'm just going to win it right now. And his boss is like, OK, how exactly are you going to do that? Because you've been doing this for two years, and you haven't got to 10%. How will you do it now? And he said, well, easy. I'm just going to bring in some people who aren't as smart as me. And his boss is like, well, who would that be? And he said, well, anybody, right? Because like, my team is the best. We figured that out. I just need to bring in some people who are diverse. Right? And we've got this theorem that says if he can bring in people who aren't as good as him or are diverse, they'll do better. Right? So they bring in these Austrians called Big Chaos who aren't very good at figuring out attributes for movies, but they're really good at figuring out how you weight the different models. So they bring them in, they almost get to 10%. Right? And they do this fancy thing where, you remember I showed you that simple summation sign? They take derivatives and stuff in order to figure out what these weights are using something called the Cressman weight function. They still don't get to 10% though. So then they look at this team in third place, fourth place, and they eventually take this Canadian team in sixth place, who they bring in. And these Canadians weren't that good at waiting, but they were really good at figuring out funky attributes to movies. Okay? So they had some of these behavioral insights that never occurred to the people at Bell Labs. And this is the big one. Okay, so this is a Will Ferrell movie, and this is a movie called Snakes on a Plane. I don't know if anybody's ever seen either of these movies. But here's the thing about these movies that the Canadians figured out. They're a lot like margaritas. And that is like right after you've had one, it seems pretty good. If you wait until the next morning, it doesn't seem so good. So it turns out there's a whole bunch of movies that if you rate them right after you watch them, you give them five stars. If you wait a couple days, you're like, oh, that was a stupid movie. And you give it two stars. So there was these sort of this snakes on a plane, Will Ferrell category that the Canadians figured out that had a huge effect, right? And so the same movie could get five stars or one star, depending on when you rate it. So when they put all these teams together, these three teams together, now they have 800 variables for each movie, which is insane, right? Their best model is now 8.4%. So there's just this bonus from this diversity, because now they've got all these different variables. So they can get to 8.4%. When they combine the models, they get to 10%, so they win, right? So they've got two different types of bonuses here. One bonus is just more variables to choose from. The other bonus is you combine a bunch of models so they win, except for they don't win. This is what's so great, because the contest rules say once you get to 10%, the contest ends in 30 days. Their reaction was pure panic at this point. The reason why is here's what they knew. There were 23 teams from 30 countries that they had been beating for two years. But prior to this, if you're an economist, these, these other teams had no reason to work together. Now when there's 30 days to go, they've got no reason not to. So they all send all their data to Berkeley and Penn. These are countries from all over the world. And they combine 48 of these models. Hundreds and hundreds of models are sent. But they combine 48 of them, and they take the lead. This group called the Ensemble takes the lead with the day to go. Right? They eventually both submit, and it's a tie. Delcor officially beats them on the fifth decimal point, but the contest only goes to four decimal points. So the tiebreaker is who submitted first. Belcourt submitted 22 minutes sooner. So fortunately, then New Jersey Public Schools got the money, right, which is great. But here's the beauty of this whole contest. The ensemble, the people combining these models were graduate students. So if you open up a thesaurus and you look up graduate student, the first synonym is snarky person. right? So these graduate students, on the ensemble's web page, when this is over, they say, here are the final results. It's official. Belcourt takes second. That's literally what their web page said. 
And they're absolutely right, because let's think through it. I've got two models that are equally good, right? So the same average error, but they're wildly diverse, right? One is combining 48 models from around the globe. One is combining, combining 17 models using 800 variables from three teams. So they're wildly different. So if I have two models that are equally good, that are diverse, what has to be better? Combining them. Has to be. It's a mathematical fact. It's like 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared if I make a right triangle, right? This just has to be true. So the challenge here when we think about leveraging diversity is thinking about how do we get people who think differently in the room? And then as Ben was mentioning, how do we make them feel safe so that they share their different models? Because if we do, we're collectively going to do better, right? So this isn't a feel-good thing. This is just a mathematical fact. Now, you could say these are people picking movies, right? And this is Neil Hunt, the chief product officer of Netflix, because this kind of cascaded on them. They thought initially this was going to be, we're going to find the person who's the best data scientist. And instead, diversity broke out, right? They didn't anticipate this at all. He's like, wow, this turned out to be all about combining diverse ideas, not in some like touchy-feely sort of diversity is a happy thing, but like the only way we could solve this problem is by putting diverse minds to it. So if you look, this is data from uh, our central bank, the Federal Reserve System. And this is a regression where they compare. We have something called the Federal Open Market Committee. And this staff forecast, if you take the 600 economists to make individual forecasts, and you run a regression on inflation, just a simple OLS regression. And then you say, how much weight should we put on the average of the staff forecast, or how much weight should we put on the FOMC forecast? You get a weight of 1 on the staff forecast, and effectively 0 on the FOMC. If you get unemployment, you get a weight of 1, or 0.97 on the staff, and minus 0.03 on the FMOC. On growth, you actually get a little bit more weight in the FMOC than on the staff. The point here is, is that you've got all these in-house staff forecasts that are just put in a book and they kind of read them. You'd actually do a lot better just averaging the staff forecast. Right? So there's using technology, right? And this was done by Christina Romer, who is Obama's chief economic advisor, because she sort of believed that they were just ignoring a lot of information. If you look at economic forecast in the European Union and the United States over a 40-year period, so this is every base, this is 28,000 forecasts by professional economists, including the ones that the ECB puts out, right, with your sort of team of economists. The crowd, so we know it's true, the crowd has to do better than the average economist. They do 21% better across all this data. 21% better. Okay? I mean, mathematically, it's got to be better, but it doesn't have to be 21% better. And here's the data. This again, this is sort of some of these studies, there's 40 economists predicting. Some of these studies, there's 12 economists predicting. Here's a benchmark of one for just an average economist. So one, an average economist has an error of one. If you just take two average economists, you do 8% better. And if you take three random economists, you do 12% better. Here's the best economist to date. Here's after the fact, if you knew the best economist. So let's say, here's the best to date. She gets 11% better. If you average in the second best economist to date with the best economist to date, you do 17% better. Now, this should be somewhat counterintuitive, right? Because it's like, Celia's the best economist. I'm second best. You would think, let's not even listen to him, <laughs> right? And that would be the normal way you'd think about it. But the reality is, if my model's different than hers, you should listen to me. Because on a high-dimensional, complex, hard problem, if we have different models, that diversity helps you out, right? And what you see is you see increases sort of all the way down to 5, 6, and 7. What about real people investing money? Well, this is a study of every single mutual fund. This is an unpublished paper, but um, I refereed it. It seems right, so I'll put the graph up. But that's why the names aren't up here. But hopefully this will become public information in a couple of weeks. If you look at the number of managers on mutual funds in the United States, so this is 10,000 funds over a 20-year period, they do 60 basis points better than funds run by one person. And you could think, well, if that's true, funds should no longer be run by one person. And guess what? That's true. So 30 years ago, 75% of funds in the United States were run by one person. Now 75% of funds are run by teams of people, right? Why? 60 basis points, right? That's not very complicated math. Okay, so the point is, if you want to, if you want to make an accurate prediction, what you want to do is you want diverse crowds. Okay, let's go to problem solving. This will be much quicker. So here's a simple test. Suppose I've got a really hard problem. And problem solving differs in prediction. In prediction, I'm trying to come up with a numerical value for something, estimate some future thing. In problem solving, I'm trying to find some solution to a problem, like maybe some way to route my trucks, some way to design a computer chip. But I've got a bunch of variables that I'm choosing among, and I want to try and find something that has really high value. So what you can do is create a bunch of agents. This is what economists call people, right? And uh, 
Think of them as having diverse perspectives, which are sort of representations of this problem. And then they've got sets of heuristics, which are methods they have of trying to solve them. And all these agents are smart. So now I create the, a group of the 20 best agents, the best individuals. And I compare them to a random 20 agents. All the agents are smart. So I'm taking the very best ones versus a random one. And I have them just kind of work collectively right, on this problem. So I can think of this as the following. I've got one group of people who are really, really good and one group of people who some of whom are good and some of them who aren't that good, right? And what you'd think in this setting is that the group of people who are good should be better than the group of people, some of whom are good and some of whom aren't that good. It turns out, though, if you sort of do the math on this, that the diverse group almost always outperforms the other group. If you use sort of reasonable size groups, like groups of size 10 or 20. The group of high ability does better if you have groups of size 1, because that means you've got the best person against a random person, right? But once you start having 10 or 20 people, this flips. And here's why. Thinking of people in terms of ability on the problem kind of misses the point, right? That's kind of your score. What you want to do is you want to ask, what tools do they have? Well, suppose this is an economic problem. It may be that all of these people have econ PhDs, and they've taken a lot of statistics and mathematics. So the third person doesn't know anything that the second person and the first person doesn't know. So if I got this alpha group, if I think in terms of toolboxes and of scores, I've got a whole bunch of people with that exact same skill set. Right? Whereas this diverse group, I may have someone who's actually studied political science, someone who knows linguistics, someone who's taken sociology, someone who knows psychology. So Andy Haldine, who's the chief economist of the Bank of England, he was in Ann Arbor um, a few months ago, and he was talking about how the Bank of England is now hiring psychologists. And I'm like, wow, is it 2017 already? Right? I mean, the point is, right, you want to think about really enlarging right, who you bring in to discuss these policy things. And Andy's great, and he's really been a leader in trying to think about how do you diversify the skill sets of the people who work in your research team. Now, the thing is, that model, this toolbox model, is a simplification. Right? And there's a famous quote by George Box that says, all models are wrong. And so I'd, the, paper, the model I just showed you, where diverse groups do better than random groups, was written by myself and Lou Hong, who's a mathematical economist um, at Loyola University in Chicago. So I was visiting Cornell, and there's a guy, John Kleinberg, at Cornell, who's much smarter than I am. He's a certified genius by the MacArthur Foundation. Right? He's won a genius award. He's a brilliant guy. So he decided to look back at the, my paper with Lou and rewrite a different model sort of like if a statistician wrote the model. So he, he went out, I'm going to pretend I'm a statistician, write the same model. So our model was we've got perspectives and heuristics. So we have people sort of coming up with representations of the world, right? So one, some of our agents might have used Cartesian coordinates, like x and y, and some would use polar coordinates, right, with a theta and an r, stuff like that. And what we showed is that like, if people who sort of use, represent problems the same way and solve it the same way get stuck at the same points. It's the formula we call that sort of getting stuck at the same local optima. So in our case, what had to be true is the problem solvers had to be smart. You had to be drawing from a diverse set of people. And the key condition was the problem had to be hard. So when we figured out what was true, it was smart people who are diverse, hard problem, right? So John's model, which he wrote with Mike Thoregu, who was a grad student of his, they said, here's our model totally different. We're going to assume that people are just distributions of solutions. So if I ask Celia, what do you think? She just dumps her ideas on the table. I dump my ideas on the table. And then we sort of like combine them or do something with them and come up with some best team idea. And so the team value is then going to be some sort of function of all the things we dump on the table. That's their model. So you can think of them as sort of a function of the following sort. So you could have a linear function or an averaging function where you just sort of like average the ideas. If that's the case, if it's a simple problem, then the best team consists of the best people. But as soon as it becomes nonlinear, as soon as you do something interesting with the ideas that throw on the table, then the best team doesn't consist of the best individuals. So they get the exact same result that we get. Completely different model, but the exact same result. And the exact same result is, as soon as the problem becomes complex, the best team doesn't consist of the best individuals. Why? Because the best individuals tend to be similar, and what you really want on hard problems is diversity. Now, what they go on to show, and this is why Kleinberg's a genius and I'm not, is that, because he uses words like submodular and supermodular, that just means nonlinear. But what they basically show is this, is that not only does the best team not consist of the best people on that problem, there's no test that you can come up with such that the people who score highest on that test are the best team. So there's no single hiring criteria you can use 
that determines the best team. Okay? Now, there's a third model that Lu Hong has that basically shows this holds generically for any function that's nonlinear in a broader class of problems. So as soon as it becomes nonlinear, there's no test. Right? What, you can't use the same test and then pick the best people. What you need to do is you need to have diverse criteria. Okay. So again, this portfolio of asset thing doesn't make any sense, right? Because portfolio, we get the average, and the groups of problem solvers, we actually typically get better than the best, right? So if I'm in a room and I have crazy ideas most of the time, you can ignore them most of the time. And if every once in a while I have a great idea, then you get to take my great idea, that rare moment when I have the great idea, right? I don't get averaged in. Otherwise, I would be like investing in Kodak, right? Where you'd lose all your money because my average return might be very, very low, right? But with a group of problem solvers, you don't care about average return. You care about the best, and you care about how can we combine and interweave best answers. And so again, if you think just sort of at a heuristic level, what that suggests is you really want to have a lot of diversity in the room. Okay, let me do a quick aside on identity diversity, because I've been talking entirely about cognitive diversity, and Siri would talk about some of this as well. But how does identity diversity relate to this, right? Because when we talk about diversity, we think about where I started, we think about things like gender, race, you know, culture, sexual orientation, that sort of stuff. And here's the funky thing, and this is worked by Catherine Phillips, this is a survey article, but if you survey hundreds and hundreds of articles, what you find is diverse groups based on identity are actually more creative, more innovative than groups that are homogeneous, right? And Catherine and I are good friends, and so we like to joke about this. She says, she's basically saying, what I just spent the last 30 minutes telling you is kind of obvious, that if you have cognitive diversity, you should do better. But what's less obvious is that identity diversity actually makes you better. And the story behind this kind of has to go as follows, right? It has to be the case that identity diversity somehow maps to cognitive diversity, which leads to better outcomes. So the operative thing has to be cognitive diversity. The question is, how does identity diversity get you to this cognitive diversity? This isn't very complicated either, but what you've got to do is you've got to kind of unpack it. So the stories, the mathematical models, aka stories that I've told you about how diversity makes you better, boil down to cognitive things like different information sets, different knowledge, different heuristics, different representation, different models, right? different ways of thinking. These things are identity diversity, gender, race, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, social class, neighborhood, right, Re religion, these sorts of things. So the question is, how do these things map to those things? Or do these things map to those things? And that's a very complicated math. But people used to sort of say, well, there must be sort of differences. These things must map to those things. So sort of, in my opinion, the best evidence that these things map to these things is that Google knows where you search, right? So they know what information you grab. Google can tell you these things with an error rate of less than 1%. So if you go to Google and ask, who am I? They will say to me, you're a 55-year-old white guy who grew up poor in rural Michigan, and you're Protestant. And I'm like, that's right. They, and they know all sorts of other things that they won't tell me that I wish I knew about myself. <laughs> right? So the point is right, that who we are affects the information we gather, the knowledge we acquire, that sort of stuff. And, like, and that can be predicted with a high degree of accuracy. So if you can predict this from this, it's incontrovertible that these things influence those things. The other last thing, and then I'll talk very quickly about some data and then some actions, is there's indirect effects. So this is some work by Sheen Levine where they created groups of people trading, and this looks at sort of market efficiency. And these were homogeneous groups, and these are diverse groups. And one of the things that you find is you get more groupthink in homogeneous groups than you get in diverse groups because of the fact that in diverse groups, because there's sort of more questioning and less trust, which we see as negative things, actually can sometimes be positive things because people will be saying, wait a minute, why are other people doing this, right? But in order for them to actually question it, in this case it works naturally because it's in a market you can bet against other people, you've got to have sort of an open, inclusive environment. Okay, so I've given you theory. Let me talk quickly data and then quickly practices. So the data is kind of amazing. So this is in computer science. Average number of authors per paper has gone from one and a half to five. Medicine has gone from one and a half to six. Brian Uzi has looked at this in gory detail, and he says, here's why. Um, if you look at team-authored papers versus um, solo-authored papers, they're four and a half times as likely to get 100 citations. This, by the way, is on a data set of 18 million papers. This is every paper ever published. So teams are, if 100 citations is like a threshold for an important paper, which is what most universities use, 
you're four and a half times as likely to get one of those if you do it as a team. If you unpack this, this is a baseline paper. What causes these team authored papers to be better? This is the baseline paper. This is if the bonus you get if you cite other important work. This is the bonus you get if you cite works that haven't been cited together in the past very often. So if I cite psychology and economics together, this is kind of a diversity bonus. And this bonus is the bonus you get is if you cite these papers and these kind of papers. So good papers and diverse papers, you get this bonus plus this bonus plus that bonus. And again, this is over sort of the 18 million papers. Richard Freeman has looked at a smaller set, much smaller. It's only 11 million papers. It's only science. And he finds, which is interesting, the number of email addresses, the number of references, and the number of past papers all increase your citations and the impact factor of the journal it's in. And homophily, which is do you work with people who come from the same ethnic group based on last name, they code last name, hurts you. So what Richard says, and it's absolutely right, the really good way to write a B-plus paper is to work from someone basically who's at your same university, you cite the same stuff over and over, you haven't written many papers, and that person's from the same ethnic group as you, which is what, unfortunately, most of us do, right? The really good papers are working with people in other universities, different ethnic groups, and citing lots of stuff. If you go back and unpack in a different way, and this is Melissa Schilling from NYU, it turns out this is an odds ratio. So adding authors, each time you add an author actually cost you in 20% 20 20 in terms of citations. But this 15 means you get a 15 times the chance of writing one of these papers with 100 citations. This atypical connect is the same thing that Uzi got it. If you connect papers that hadn't sort of been connected in the past. So what's really driving this is not more authors. You might think, oh, you just get more citations, so you get more authors. It's not more authors, it's more ideas. More authors actually hurt you accounting for everything else. It's the more ideas that helps you. Lada Adamic has looked at this with patents. What you're seeing here is um, this is the paper data, this is the patent data. This is, on this axis, is sort of how good the patent is or how good the paper is. This is the top, this is the top 1%, this is the bottom 60%. This is a measure of proximity, which is how similar the authors are who worked on this in terms of their research. What you get is that, again, in the B plus area are all these patents and all these papers that are high proximity, which means that there's not a lot of diversity in the things you're citing. And the very best ones and the very worst ones are diverse. And this is the management challenge. And this is something that if you look at the management literature, it says the same thing. If you look across hundreds and hundreds of studies, the best teams are diverse, the worst teams are diverse, the homogeneous teams are the B pluses, right? And this is why people no longer just talk about diversity, they talk about diversity and inclusion, right? Because it's about practice. So how does the practice work? Really quickly, and then we'll have some um, like 10 minutes for questions. So first thing you want to do is you want to think about casting wide net. So my friend Sheen Levine says, he has this wonderful phrase he uses called the siren call of sameness. Like, he who looks like me is smart, right? You've really got to sort of avoid that. Um, Google has worked really hard at this. Google gets over 3 million job applicants a year, which is a lot, right? And so because they get so many job applicants, they've got really good data on this. And what they've found is that problem solving ability is sort of the main criteria they use for hiring. And they look for sort of different ways that people solve problems. People tend to think that Google only hires from like elite, the elite institutions. Well, here's the Ivy League. Cornell's the highest ranked Ivy League, which is actually part public. They're seventh. Harvard is 10th. And Penn is 19th. The public schools like California, Michigan, where I teach, Wisconsin, Washington, Illinois, San Jose State, Berkeley. They actually hire much more from public schools from the elite privates, right? But the, the main thing to notice is they're hiring from tons and tons of schools, and that's because they want this diversity. When you think about it as a manager, though, once you've got, you want to think about inclusion is starting really on Sunday night. Because the key message I have, in some sense, is that diversity helps you on these hard problems. So I don't know if you, like, so in my world, everybody uses sort of Outlook calendar, right? So you sort of look in your week and you say, okay, this is what's ahead of me for the week. What you need to do, I think, is think about, okay, what are the decisions or what are the meetings I have during this week where these are really hard problems, right? And on the meetings that are really hard problems, you want to think about, okay, who should I have at that meeting? How should I prep those people at those meetings, right? Because it shouldn't necessarily be, it's harder, it's costlier, it takes more time to manage a diverse group. So you don't want to have a diverse group if you're sitting around deciding what food you're going to have at the reception, because that's just going to eat up a lot of time, no pun intended. 
right? But what you do want to do is have a diverse group when you're thinking about really complicated policy decisions. But you also have to have some forethought in terms of thinking about who should be at those, heart, at those, those meetings. All the evidence suggests in order to make people feel safe, in order to really create an inclusive environment, you've got to make agendas available beforehand and actually make sure people had time to read the materials beforehand, especially because people who come from less safe places or don't feel as secure or aren't in the majority group need to make sure that they're informed before the meeting starts. Some organizations, and I've got the companies at the bottom that do this just to sort of give them credit for this, at a place like Boeing, when they have a meeting, a new meeting of a group, the person in charge of the meeting will explain why each person is at the meeting. And if you can't explain why I'm at the meeting, then maybe I shouldn't be there, <laughs> right? Because the answer shouldn't be, Scott looks like me, so I wanted him at the meeting, right? That's not a good reason. Um, a lot of places like Ford and AB InBev, which I've worked with, which have a culture of doing things fairly quickly, um, what they'll do is they'll do relatively fast direct reports. This is how they sort of like leverage diversity without wasting time. They've sort of speeded up the direct reports and then people can just basically raise a flag and say, here's where I'm having trouble, right? Here's where I'm getting stuck. And then and you focus everybody's attention on the things that are hard. Places like Google, the New York Fed does this to some extent. They'll require that everybody speaks at a meeting because you're not there as an observer. Now, this can get a little bit into sort of culture of fear. But the thing is, once people sort of accept it, right, then it can kind of work. And then the last point I want to bring out is that in this space of diversity, and I think this is the hardest thing to work on, is that efforts to be inclusive can also sometimes not take people as seriously as they should. So this is Kim Scott. I don't know if you can read her name at the bottom. She has this wonderful book out where she talks about radical candor. And she tells this amazing story about she was working at Google, and she presented to Larry and Sergey, and, and they said, your unit is doing great, and they're going to give her unit all this extra money to do more stuff. And she walks out of there and she's like all excited, you know, everything went great. And her boss at the time, who was Sheryl Sandberg, who obviously everybody knows, right, the CEO of Facebook, and Sheryl chases her down and says, you said um a lot at the meeting. And Kim's like, whatever. And Sheryl's like, no, 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 you said um a lot. Kim's like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. And then Sheryl grabs her by the shoulders and says, you're going to think you're facing a glass ceiling, but you're going to face an um ceiling. And I'm going to send you to an um coach on Monday. I know a really good um coach, and you're going to the um coach, right? So Kim wrote this book on going to the um coach, and she has this great two by two chart. This is just brilliance, right? So she says, look, when you think about managing, you have to care about people personally, and you also have to challenge people directly. If you challenge people, but they don't think you care about them, you're in this obnoxious aggression box. But the danger with inclusion is if you, care, if you create this inclusive environment where you're caring about people personally, but you're not challenging them, you end up in the ruinous empathy box. That's where you don't tell the person right, that they've got an um ceiling. So we've had, I was, I was working with a company, and they had someone who had been, uh, this was a minority female, this is in the United States, and she wasn't coming to work on time, right? So her they were thinking of promoting her, and her evaluations were all great, except for in one category, right, come to work on time. She wasn't coming to work on time. And they almost weren't going to promote her, but then they decided, well, let's ask her about this. Right? Let's at least give her the benefit of the doubt. And it turned out, you know, she was managing West Coast accounts, working on the East Coast, and her boss had said, doesn't matter if you show up on time, her first boss, but then... Her other bosses never, you know, she kept never showing up on time for seven years. And the other bosses, nobody ever called her on it. And she's like, you're kidding me. I'll get it promoted if I show up on time? No problem, right? I mean, she's handing billions of dollars in accounts. But she had been in the ruinous empathy box. Everyone was so happy to have her there that no one was challenging her directly about showing up. And then her performance was suffering, right? So what you have to do, I think, in order to have a really effective, inclusive policy is recognize that these diversity bonuses, these benefits from diversity, come from challenging people's ideas, right? Deeply engaging their ideas. But the only way you get the ideas to engage them is by caring about people personally, right? By creating a place where people feel safe and included. And then you end up in this sort of what she calls the radical candor box, which is, I think, where this good stuff can happen. All right, thank you very, very much. And I think we have about 10 minutes. Yeah, okay.
So we have 10 minutes and we have a microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah.